video is really the only digital channel of communication where body language and those choices speak volumes, right? Like you think about the playground that people see of you and it's limited, which is sure a challenge in some senses because it means that we're missing out on other nonverbal cues, but it's also a huge opportunity because it means that you can control what people see. This is On Camera, On Brand, a show for professionals who want to look good on camera, but don't have the time or expertise to turn their office into a Hollywood studio. In each episode, Rob Rusher uncovers how professionals can get the most from their home or office setups. If you invest the time to share your stories on camera, you should be on brand. So why don't we just start with, I know your story as a, you were a ballerina, professional dancer, correct? And then... Mm -hmm transferred so i guess i hope you're not sick of hearing this question but do you want to tell us how you made that leap into kind of the tech marketing and a tech founder of, mm -hmm. of virtual sapiens yeah for sure it, it can sound like such an alien leap when you kind of put it that way but the the core piece that has been common throughout this entire narrative and evolution from from being a professional ballet dancer to being the ceo co-founder at virtual sapiens is the the communication aspect and focus right so as a dancer your whole world in life is oriented around the nonverbal aspects of expression right dancers are famous for never speaking <laughs> on stage right and so that was my perspective for the longest time and when i left the ballet in 2016 and started working in more of a relationship driven role at harvard and fundraising I just I noticed I had this sensibility both in terms of the way I showed up, but also in things that I would notice in others, little inefficiencies that were happening in their communication. And so I did start to develop a body of work around coaching and facilitating in those specific skill areas, right? Nonverbal communication, body language, presence, and loved that work, right? That was more of your traditional coaching one to many workshops or private one-on-ones. And then when the pandemic happened and the conversation went online, I continued coaching virtually, right, over video and helping people understand how they could show up on video and be effective. And it was at that, it was through that experience that I was like, you know, I keep repeating myself in these sessions. And not only am I repeating myself, but the reinforcement that needs to go hand in hand with what I'm saying so that we can actually start to rewire some of these habits because so much of this feels unnatural for people was where I was like, it just seems like maybe we can leverage some AI to do this more efficiently. And that was the nugget that then led to virtual sapiens. Yeah. And I almost, and just to rewind, because this struck out and, and a little off topic, but I'm very interested. Do you think you mentioned showing up a few times and like the importance of it? Do you think do you trace that back to being a dancer and like that discipline of like when you go on stage or when you're performing, like this is how you show up. You take the time to, you know, whether it's the stretch and to do the hair and everything. Do you feel like that's just carried over professionally? Definitely. I mean, I think a number of things have carried over for me professionally. The preparation that goes into the moments before a performance, right, are very similar in feeling to the moments before an important presentation or an important sales call, right, where you ideally want to take some space for yourself, remind yourself of your intention, remind yourself of your goals, of, you know, the energy you want to have coming into that meeting. Um, but then also, you know, the mindset or, or concept of constant improvement. In ballet, you know, quick wins just never happen. It's, it's like the daily 1% efforts that are like renewed over time is, is what guarantees success. So that mindset, I think, also has fed some of the way we built our tools at Virtual Sapiens, but then also, you know, some of the just the mindset behind coaching and improvement in practice. I'll tell my daughter that she's six and she's starting dance and she oh. likes tap, but she's just like, yeah, says how hard it is. And I'm like, honey, I don't I don't think you learn it in one day. You know, you've done a couple right. classes. <laughs> It's going to take a little little time. No, I yeah. think that's really interesting with the showing up because I even noticed with myself with when I actually put on like clothes I would wear to an office or going out, I just feel more focused and I'm feeling like I can like 
get more done in a day. And I feel like that does, I, like people notice that, you know, when you show up on Zoom calls. And especially now it's it's far enough past the pandemic. And I know we've had this chat before where it's like the bar's risen, yeah. I feel like, to show up. And if you're really trying to make an impact on camera or in these meetings, I feel like you can't just show up, you know, with your laptop in your kitchen anymore. And And sometimes you have to, and we get that. But I think if you're actually trying to drive revenue by being on camera, yeah. um, how you show up. So let's take us to when did you start seeing the value of being on camera? When did like the idea for virtual sapiens where, and maybe even to back up and, and to slow myself, do you want to give just that quick overview of what virtual sapiens is, what the company you founded? Definitely. So virtual sapiens uses AI and computer vision to help professionals assess, improve, and then master their video presence. And we we're unique in the sense that we started with a very strong focus on the nonverbal visual aspects of communication on video. There's a lot of attention that's being thrown at what is being said and the content and some of the AI around that space. And, and we still sit pretty firmly, but definitely initially started with helping people understand some of the behaviors that may be sending messages, most likely unintentionally. Right. And to your point of like people probably notice when you do show up to a meeting and you're dressed appropriately and you've taken the time to orient your lens and your background so that they're conducive to a non-distracted conversation. Video is really the only digital channel of communication where body language and those choices speak volumes. Right. Like you think about the playground that people see of you and it's limited, which is sure, a challenge in some senses, because it means that we're missing out on other nonverbal cues, but it's also a huge opportunity because it means that you can control what people see. And, you know, you can, if you give yourself the right distance and you have the right lens or whatever, like you can be a very dynamic human being and you can really leverage a lot of nonverbals to your advantage. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So with that, it started nonverbal and was there like almost a specific problem or person you had in mind when you were creating it? Or was it something even for yourself? Was it just kind of like a fun, like, as I'm always curious with, with a lot of these softwares that seem so obvious, but it's like, so where, like, almost like what was those first initial thoughts where like, okay, not only is this like, like a problem you're solving, but also this could be something, you know, I could build something from this. Yeah. So for most of my time coaching, I was always trying to figure out how, like, how could we introduce some scale here? And the issue with, with trying to introduce some scale before the pandemic was that video was just not in use in any meaningful way, right? Like, yes, we were seeing it rise a little bit in use even before the pandemic, but to ask someone, a client, for example, or, you know, a room full of 30 people, like, okay, record yourself on this app and then you'll get some feedback. Like, nobody's going to, it, it was too far removed from the reality of their in-person situation, right? So when, when COVID happened and it was like every single conversation, if you wanted to have a face-to-face, -face, it had to be over video. I was really seeing like, more than just the pandemic being the reason that video would be a channel of communication, the conveniences of it, the efficiency of it, the cost savings of being able to take a meaningful conversation online. I thought really was indicative of video hanging around. And again, like in these training sessions that I was doing as a live facilitator, I was like, it would be so amazing if I could just give every single person in this room, like their own private coach, their own sidekick or their own little portal that they could go into and practice. And in, in a sense, it was like, how can we democratize some of what I can only do to a very limited extent, you know, and to date it had been, you know, okay, we'll just like hire a bunch of other facilitators, but it becomes pretty cost prohibitive for an organization to have small, you know, bespoke workshops where the ratio between the facilitator and the participants is such that people can get individualized, personalized feedback, right? Because it's like you might say, like, everyone needs to be careful with their framing, but actually, like, this person needs to, like, make sure that they're not showing up in the lower third, and this other person mm -hmm. needs to make sure that they're not looking down on the lens. Like, it's specific, right? 
Some people might be using too many hand gestures and other people may not be using hand gestures at all. So getting, getting that kind of more scaled version of personalized feedback through AI is, was, was something that I was looking for. Yeah, and it's there's almost two parts to it, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but just just as using it, and and you mentioned the sidekick that that was my favorite because it just kind of pops up, and I actually enjoyed it for the pre-recorded content I used a lot. So if I'm talking to camera and doing like intros and outros, you know, it just kind of makes a little pop noise if you're looking down too much or if you're up, and you know, I'm guilty of of the likes, and so it's nice to kind of have that. And then the other part was through the browser where. And I just remember the first time it, I thought you were actually on the call and it kind of like took me off guard, you know, when you do the practice. And I love that though, because I actually went back and I was able to practice more. I thought that was like a great way, like to kind of put yourself on the spot and feel like it's real without even having to deal with recording or, or anything else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we do like to be clear, we have those two, pro we have two different products, right? We have the assessment product, which is a great tool for practice and baseline and progress improvement. It's it's not a tool that's designed to be used on calls, right? So it's really that like video based assessments kind of. And right as you said, it's it's funny that you we use currently a pre recorded version of myself, and that's something that we're like, okay, how do we like make that more dynamic? And just this morning, we were trying some of the like AI generated video, and it is brutal. I mean, oh, it it's it's not it. good at all. No, it's, it's the person looks pretty realistic, but it's the intonation. It's the way that they put words together, the way that they don't blink. It's, it's just super creepy. So until that gets better, it'll have to just be me. Man. So, so tell me about the, it is crazy. Sometimes my, like, I, I sometimes need like a pause in my brain because like the AI can get so deep into it. And I'm sure maybe you've experienced this, like you're researching and it's just like, all right, I'm going to spend today. I'm going to master this whole thing. And it's like, I get to like lunchtime, my brain's a little fried. And I, I'm like, I think I've learned like a few new things, but yeah, just like keeps going and going. Have you had a tough time like focusing on what AI elements to focus on, I guess, if that makes sense? Or how do you know like which lanes to go down as you're implementing AI? I think any startup in particular struggles with that in terms of like, okay, we're so fledgling. There are so many things we could do. Like what from a, like an ROI or like bang for your buck makes most sense to do. And so initially, you know, we completely ignored the verbal side of things because there was so much of that, right? Like there's already a bias towards that. You can get transcription services, you can get filler word counts, you can get a lot of support in terms of what you're saying. And we were just seeing a huge blind spot when it came to like, okay, but what about everything that's not being said, right? That on video is so loud. But once we, like now we have like a pretty amazing and sophisticated body of nonverbal communication and insights and, and feedback and so it's always like, yeah, like to your point, like what's next? I think it was becoming more and more clear, especially because now like with ChatGPT came out and these like verbal based AI tools really swept the globe, people's table stakes expectations went up, right? And so for us to not offer any intelligence on the verbal side, I think would have become more and more of an issue because now people are expecting it, right? And so, and so that was kind of where I was like, I think we have to close this gap now. Like we have this amazing advantage, but, we, but now we have to fill the part of the bucket that, you know, is low hanging fruit. Like it's not like it was too yeah. hard. But. No, and it's really interesting because then you can offer like a full service, you know, solution, which I feel like, you know, more and more, I feel like that's what you know, especially in the B2B audience is expecting is oh. like, they don't want 20 apps, you know, they just want one per area to Definitely. handle it. And even with my own business, I found when I'm still doing a lot of the on camera consulting, but it almost seems like that comes after doing like post work for a client or working on their videos already. You know, it's almost like the bigger need is that. So I, I wonder if, if you'll find that where maybe you even get a bigger rush of, of clients and stuff because you're handling all the transcriptions. So tell me, yeah, what are you doing now with the new rollouts of the AI edition? Right. Yep. So as I was saying before, things like 
facial expression, variation, body posture, hand gestures, eye gaze, different types of face touching. That's all stuff that we've been doing since the beginning. And now we have the vocal cues. So we look at vocal intonation, right? Making sure you're not monotonous. We look at speech speed. So the degree to which you are varying your speech speed, but then also your average, like words per minute. And then most recently we added transcription and filler words. So you know, something that makes our application a little unique is that we don't like to isolate metrics as their own, just kind of like arbitrary numbers, right? So filler words is actually nested under authority impression. Because if you think about like, okay, why should you care about filler words? Like, why does it actually matter when it comes to your communication? If you're using too many filler words or you're repeating the types of filler words over and over again, it significantly reduces the impression of authority that you show up with, right? It, it affects your vocal clarity and introduces a lot of noise and, and will impede the message you're trying to send from that authority perspective. So it'll affect your authority impression score. Yeah, I, I've even noticed that now I'm doing a lot of editing of my own stuff on Descript. And it's funny, I've gotten better at it. But at first, when you listen to it, and you, you go from hearing it with the like or whatever, and then you swap it and you delete all those, you're like, oh, wow, that's that just sounds better. Like, I like that more, even without not. And now what you just explained makes sense of, of the why. But that's interesting. So thank you. That, that solved that full circle. Because yeah. I was like, man, this is sounding way better. And have you... With your own work, have you noticed you've become like a much better speaker on camera? Because I've noticed I've touched my face a lot less. I still do it, but I always want to like touch my beard for yeah. some reason. And then I just now I, I have like a little PTSD of the pop that's going to come up. So that's it's working. It's working. That, that's hysterical. Yeah. The, any kind of it's interesting, just like any kind of face touching nonverbal or, or action in, in nonverbal communication is called a pacifying behavior. And so, right. So any kind of self touch like these fiddling things that people may do or tucking the hair behind the ear or even playing with the hair is a pacifying behavior in the sense that it helps calm you down. So part of the reason why, you know, you might want to, it's soothing. And it, while it may be soothing and that's okay, again, it depends on like the context of what you're, like the message you're communicating and where you're communicating it. You don't necessarily want to be sending nonverbals that you need to be soothed or that you may be in a period of slight discomfort. And so you're going to start, you know, just calming yourself down a little bit, right? Instead, you want to show up in a way that is, especially like when the real estate we have on video is so small, right? You want to make sure it's as, like your face is as clear and visible as possible just to help with that. But yeah, I think the way people learn and the way people rewire some of those behaviors takes a number of reinforcement, right? And like those, so those nudges and reminders can be really powerful. Yeah. And I think that's why what you have in the real time is so nice because I will sometimes re-listen to what I record. You know, usually I don't re-listen to the whole episode unless I'm really, you know, trying to improve something. So I love how yours does it in real time because a lot of times you might just think, well, that was good enough. And if you don't, take the time to re-listen to your work, you know, or re-watch what you recorded, I don't know if you'll always realize you're making those mistakes. Like I said, I didn't really notice I would, like, do the beard touch so much and a lot of ums and likes. So I've been trying to, you know, work on that, which is great. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to, when people ask, even with the on-camera, like, how do you tie ROI? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know exactly, but it makes me more confident. So I record more content and I'm reaching out to more people. So, like, it, it's coming there at some point, but sometimes I don't know if you find tricky with that, like with tying ROI to the looking and sounding better on camera. But I, I think just threw like three things at you right there. So sorry. Well, no, 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 absolutely. And I, I also realized I didn't answer the other part of your question earlier, which is like, have I found improvement myself? And the answer is yes. And interestingly, like I'm on the farther end of the expression and energy spectrum, right? I'm like, I always want to be performing and expressing and whatever. And so I learned that it's actually can be helpful for me to tone it down just a little bit. I don't always have to be just like constantly so bright. And so it's okay, it's okay for me to change up my facial expressions a little bit. It adds a more dynamic quality and actually I think can increase my authority as well. So that was a fascinating discovery because the AI will just really pick up on repeated behaviors and patterns, right? And those are the things that can be hard 
for us to notice on our own. But going back to the question you just asked, which was what? Oh, Ask. geez. No, geez. Now we're, I know, man. Um, oh, oh, no. Like kind of like the ROI of, of, yeah, like, looking what, better like, and, and, and taking the time to even improving it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think that if you're improving the way you're showing up as a communicator and the impression that you are sending to people, right, the things that we're affecting, we're affecting the authority that you have, right? So now all of a sudden, like, I tend to believe what you say because you're, you're coming across with such confidence and authority on a subject that you clearly know a lot about, right? Especially for anyone who is selling a product or a service or a company, right? Being able to show up and exhibit markers of perceived trustworthiness is critical because if two people or two companies show up with competing products and there's one person who shows up on video and is on time, has great lighting framing, is very comfortable on video, can exhibit great empathy and rapport building, and then the other person is like, it doesn't really matter, you know, they'll just like, so long as like whatever, people can like sort of see me, you know, I think it's fine. It just so long as people can hear me. That's not I do really point. like your ceiling light though. That thing's <laughs> it's, awesome. It's so I love that. Plastic. Oh my god. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like, okay, yeah. in that environment, right? Which is the environment most sellers live in. It's super competitive. There are numbers of other companies who are doing very closely what you're doing. So it's it's going to be the human seller mm -hmm. in that moment who can build a relationship of rapport, respect, and trust. And that's gonna come from the way you show up on video. And then, sorry, one other thing, because I do think this is important, specifically related to content and like video content. I think there's a relationship between how much of your video is watched and how you're showing up and how engaging and dynamic you're being on it. Like how easy and compelling are you making it for the audience to watch you, to become fixated with you versus like how unpleasant and annoying and pressed, like how, how many barriers are you putting up for your audience to have to like, be okay with to get to your content. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I would even say that's why recently I found so much, I've been putting more effort into shorts. And in a similar way, I've just thought of like my own process of either following someone that I listen to all the time or a place I buy from it. It's like, you gotta leave the breadcrumbs because it's hard to say, I'm gonna just jump into 30 minutes. I've never heard of this Rob guy. Like, no, that's not gonna happen. But if I pop up on your shorts, you might, you might, you know, give it a chance, you know, at least to see the first 10 seconds. So yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. Like the easier we can make it for people to connect with us and, and our product or our company's product, I think you're going to see good results. I feel like Yeah. we understand that it's important to show up on camera and those listening that agree with this and feel like they want to get better. What do you suggest? Where can people get started or even utilizing your product to get started to start improving being on camera? We have a very accessible free trial, actually, of both of our products, the assessment and the in-call sidekick. And I, I would definitely recommend as a, as a perfect starting point is to just go to our website, virtualsapiens.co, and try out the free trial of the assessment. It's, it's going to take you maybe five minutes you get in the free trial version, you get like an overview of the communication categories and how you've scored in each of them. And we have, as, as an individual, you can go in and pay to unlock and, you know, take as many assessments as you'd like. So while we're focused on B2B and teams, we wanted to make sure it was available for individuals as well, any in, in, interested individual. So I'd recommend try, like starting with that. It's a really friendly way to get a baseline on some of the things that maybe you know about yourself, but also most likely a lot of things you don't. It's just like the tool is designed to pick up on blind spots and things that people may notice, but are unlikely to tell you. And for me, at least I found it wasn't like huge things. It was just like, oh, I can just think on this, you know, the light. Oh, I just did it. See, I even know I'm doing it. The likes and ums and the beard touching it was almost like just by changing that, I, I feel like I improved my my footage my quality of content yeah and it's better obviously to nail it because when you're live you can't edit yourself out and descript afterwards <laughs> right so for meetings and presentations and and demos in terms of and i'm curious with your the the people who are using your product the most is there in b2b is there is it mostly companies selling software so the 
the team that's demoing the software? Where are you finding people using your products? We see a lot of onboarding. So if you have any remote or video-based component to your job, it's within that manager's and the company's best interest to make sure that you're outfitted and prepared to show up and represent the company effectively on video. So that that's a, a perfect use case is, you know, and, and in terms of like what kinds of companies we tend to be working with a lot, like there's usually an emphasis on the client facing team. So sales teams, customer success, leaders, managers, and we do also do some work with coaching firms in particular. So if there's a sales coaching firm or a communication training firm, we'll partner with them and they'll either white label or resell our product so that for them, right, so they have a model that's based on the live facilitation. And when they use our tool, they can introduce some scale to what would otherwise be, you know, such in the moment coaching. So their coaches are empowered by with a tool where they can get get a little more data on their the way that their coach coaches are improving without necessarily having to like be in the room with them at the time of the presentation, right? Which is which would be very expensive. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, and that's I didn't even think the onboarding, that's a what a unique idea. Like in terms of like a lot of companies will buy the hardware, right, to work at home. But I don't know how often they offer some training or quick start guides, you know, to utilize it, and especially with a product like yours to really improve. So, yeah, that's a was that something you thought of or was that asked for and then you kind of pushed that more or how did that come out? Come well, it out? just seemed like such a natural fit because even even still today, like everyone's trying to figure out people are trying to figure out remote onboarding and how to make it engaging and personalized and effective and just not not as static as what it essentially is today. And because our product is like, it's fun, people like it, it's engaging, it's fast, it's convenient, it's self-serve, but it's so personal, like everyone's gonna get a different result, right? Everyone's gonna have something different to work on. And that kind of thing is a huge value add when you're looking at like bringing in like a hundred new employees every month or whatever it may be. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, that's great. So where where can people find all the information on you? Where are you, are you most active on LinkedIn? Or where can we find Rachel and, and all the things Virtual Sapiens? LinkedIn's great. If you follow me or Virtual Sapiens on LinkedIn, that's definitely where we have most of our activity. We post one piece of thought leadership, whether it's a video or an article every week. And then our website's a great place to learn more about us and, and give it a try for yourself. And that is virtualsapiens.co, yes. not dot .com, dot .co. Yes. I like, to, I like to make that extra thing because I'm the first one to, I put dot .com on everything, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. I'm guilty of that. But cool. Same. well, thank you so much for taking the time and, and coming. And I'm glad we got a chance to finally talk and we'll have to have to talk more soon. Absolutely, Rob. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks. Thanks for checking out On Camera, On Brand. This episode is produced by Motion, a podcast agency that helps B2B organizations create their own shows. If you enjoyed what you learned, check out more episodes at motionagency.io slash on camera on brand.